Well, well, here we are, and we're back. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I have a correction, Terry, for you, for, for those of you who care. Um, Warren James himself of, of the planetarium, is he, is he an astronomer then? Or what is he going to do? Well, whatever, whatever it is that he's going to do at the planetarium, he's not going to do it this Monday. He's going to do it a week from this Monday. He called himself to tell us that. So that's the story on that. Thank you very much, for, uh, Warren, for calling. Now we are back and reading uh, clockwise from my <laughs> position here. We have uh, Mark Shepard, friend of those who want no friends. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> clockwise from him, we have James Van Heis of Enterprise Incidents. Hello, hello. Yes. And clockwise from him, we have Mark Wielage, who is his guest tonight. Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with the other Mark. I'm Mark with a C. He's probably Mark with a K. So yeah, but you can tell the difference. I'll oh, tell the difference. Yeah. Well, especially on radio. Okay. On the radio, sure. And you're you're gotcha. in, but and you're wearing glasses and. And, you, and your hair is parted on. <laughs> yeah, and you yes. used to. Yeah, right. And I'm not. Mm, uh, anyway, tonight we're going to talk about Steven Spielberg because um, James Van Heys and Mark Wielage are writing a book about Steven Spielberg, which is probably not called Skywalking. What is it called? Anything but. Anything no, no. but. It'll, 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 it'll probably be called the films of Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. It, well, it'll be completely different from Skywalking. And but before we get into that, you had something, James, important yeah, to say. Yeah, it hasn't really been announced in uh, all the news publications or anything yet, but about two weeks ago, uh, Pacific Comics, the publishers of The Rocketeer and Alien Worlds and Twisted Tales, uh, declared bankruptcy. Oh. Uh -huh. And all of their comic book titles are being taken over by other publishers, uh, largely Eclipse. And unfortunately, uh, Pacific has had to throw in the towel, which is... Very sad because those of you who have followed the uh, current comic book uh, field, Pacific uh, had a big influence on uh, creators' rights and residuals and things which are accepted as commonplace in comics today, even at Marvel and DC, which uh, seven years ago uh, were just dreams of uh, many of the professionals. Maybe Pacific Comics could start making cartoons. Mm. That'd be. That I think he's be saying it's all over. It's all over. Yeah. Yeah. They'd be lucky if they could yeah. start making their payments. They, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. so. Yeah. Well, that's too bad. But it did but, give a start. To, but it was not the fault of their publishing. Their publishing was successful, but unfortunately, they had a distribution company which was losing money because a lot of people were not able to pay their bills. There was no way to go to a different distributor then. No, I mean they were selling to people who could not pay for oh, it. So bought. the dealers oh, owed see. them thousands of dollars that they can yes. never collect. Oh, that's too bad. I mean, when a when a business runs up a tab of fifty thousand dollars, you're afraid to cut them off because then you cut off any chance of ever getting it. Right. But if you don't cut them off, they're mm -hmm. running up an even bigger bill, and you get caught in this catch twenty two. Terrible mm -hmm. thing. Terrible. And unfortunately, thing. it caught up with them at last. Hmm. Okay. So, so word to the wise: don't get into the magazine publishing business. Not right away. Or distributing. No, it's distributing. Right. It's yeah. a rough, not, not this rough week. business. Well, let's talk about Steven Spielberg. Yeah, we'd like to get into a lot of the early, go uh, chronologically, get into the early years of things which a lot of people aren't aware of uh, Steven Spielberg's early career. And many people think Steven Spielberg just appeared from out of nowhere. Full blown Jaws. from the head of, yeah. of George Lucas. Yeah, some people think it's, uh, George Lucas found him under a rock. But yeah. that's, that's not true. That's not true, or even nice. Not at all. No. Because no. his uh, first professional work was uh, one of the segments of the Night Gallery pilot in which. As a 21-year-old director, he directed Joan Crawford. And with that film, uh, Spielberg began starting the wonderkind reputation that has since followed him throughout all of his productions in Hollywood. And uh, that film, which was made in, uh, what, January of 69? Yeah. Uh, did star Joan Crawford, and it was a real baptism by fire for Spielberg because he had this tempestuous, fading Hollywood star who was uh, kind of down on her luck making her comeback in this uh, limited made-for-TV movie. And uh, so it was quite a challenge for him to uh, pick up the reins and try to direct a big crew of 20 or 30 hardened Hollywood veterans who looked at this uh, kid who was still going to college and said, you know, what the hell is this guy doing Well, how did he get studio? to that point? How did he get to It's an interesting story. Basically, uh, Spielberg grew up making films, as the legend goes. He uh, uh, criticized his father's uh, Super 8 uh, epics in the uh, Home 50s. Movies. Actually, excuse me, 8 millimeter. correct mm -hmm. myself, technically accurate here. And uh, his father said, well, if you think you can do such a good job here, you know, and handed him the camera and let uh, young Spielberg direct his, the family's movies. 
and he went at it with a vengeance. He edited and cut and would make everybody stand in certain positions and go out of the room and come back in again so he could catch them sitting down at the table and going off on vacations and so on. So he made just great little little uh, movies, little epics of all his family's adventures in those days. Anyway, he uh, became quite prodigious at this and got a talent for it, a knack. Moved out to California, went to Long Beach University in the late uh, 60s, and eventually realized after banging on some doors that the only way he was ever going to get anywhere in Hollywood was to make a film and mm -hmm. let people see it. So by hook and by crook, and with his friend, uh, who was the cinematographer of E.T.? Alan Davial, that's his name, Alan Davial. They uh, got together as students at Long Beach and made a 15-minute film called Amblin, which was a very simple story about a uh, teenage boy and girl who were crossing the desert and thumbing a ride along the highway trying to get a ride to L.A. And it was told very simply with very little dialogue but beautifully shot very professionally filmed in 35 millimeter, which mm -hmm. is very, very unusual for a student film. And uh, again, by hook and by crook, he was able to sneak into Universal, and many people know that legend of how Spielberg snuck past the guards over there on Lancashire Boulevard and bluffed his way through and managed to uh, get on the lot. And by getting on the lot, he was able to gain the confidence of some of the old timers there and got a couple of executives at the studio to see his little 15-minute movie. He wore a suit every day, so they, yeah, which, he which still holds right. today if anybody right. wants to do this. He cut his hair short, he said hello to Scotty the guard there yeah. on Lancashire Boulevard, walked right through and uh, made his fortune. I think it should be said that, that at the, I, I remember that time pretty clearly because I was starting to make films myself and, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, at school, and it, uh, it was, it was it's the perfect example, the crystal clear example of being making all the right moves and being in the right place at the right Absolutely. time because the door was open for I that would say, one little time. Only. I would say for Spielberg at that time, the reason for his early success was 50% talent, but at least 50% luck. He was very lucky, but he knew how to push and when sure. to do it. Hmm. So uh, one day, Sid Scheinberg, who is now president of the studio and was in the 60s head of Universal's TV department, happened to screen this short film at the end of his day's uh, dailies and said, hey, this kid's got some talent. Called him in and said, kid, I'm going to sign you up as a director before your 21st birthday. And sure enough, he was out shooting Joan Crawford in a month. Hmm. And how did he get along with John, Joan Crawford? Did they, did they oh, get that's, that's a long story. Well, go ahead. But, uh, we've got all night. Hey, we've got all night here. But give me, give me the abbreviated, the Reader's Digest condensed version. The Reader's Digest version is uh, they didn't get along too well for the first couple of days. And I think Joan perhaps resented having to work with such a young, fledgling director. But he, uh, you know, he, he was very respectful of her. He uh, called her Miss Crawford every day on the set. He did some research and studied her old films so that he could at least speak knowledgeably about what she had done in the past. I guess he watched Mildred Pierce three or four times. And, uh, and eventually she softened up and said, maybe I'll make the best of this. Mm -hmm. And she did very well. I uh, interviewed Barry Sullivan at length because uh, Sullivan co-starred with Joan Crawford in that 30-minute uh, segment. And Sullivan told me that at the time, Joan, Joan's memory was fading a little bit. Mm. It was very difficult for her to memorize dialogue. And remember in this night gallery segment, which was called Eyes, and was written by Rod Serling uh, a few years before as part of a short story collection. Uh, Joan was playing a blind woman, a uh, cold, calculating millionaire, millionaire, millionaires, I should say, who was trying to buy the eyesight of another man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically, Joan was having trouble with her lines, so Barry Sullivan took her aside and said, you know, uh, once I had to play a blind man in a play, and I found that I also had trouble remembering my lines. So what I did was I used cue cards in the wings and managed to get through the production that way. And she believed him, believed that little white lie, and that's how they got her through. They used hmm. cue cards. And if you watch the movie today, occasionally you can see her look a little bit off stage at what I presume were cue cards. She used them with a blindfold, too, in a, in a later scene in the film, and I think they cut a little hole Oh, the blindfold <laughs> so that she could see the cards. But you can't tell that by watching the film. It's a very skillful job, and although recently uh, Spielberg has poo-pooed his early film, I think it really shows that there was a, a very good budding talent 
even in a film as simple and short as that one. And there are touches, especially toward the end, which he does now. Oh, definitely. Stuff he does now. Of course, Spielberg later went on to do films like Duel, which was shown last night, I think, on Channel 13. There's a Spielberg yeah. festival, isn't it, on Channel 13? I this think week? sort of a mini festival. Yeah, tonight right they saying. showed uh, Sugarland Sugar Express. Express. Mm -hmm. And Raiders is on cable. That's right. Yeah. So this is uh, a big Steven Spielberg month, I think. Mm -hmm. But not everything he directed in uh, TV is still available. He did a lot of episodic uh, TV shows, things which didn't last very long, like The Psychiatrist some shows which came and went mm -hmm. sure he did an episode of marcus welby md uh, another episode of owen marshall talk about that fame is the name of the game episode because that's a fascinating they, they very interesting story yeah, uh, written by philip wiley that's right really uh, yeah My this was terrific. this was a most unusual episode of name in the game uh it was done a gene berry episode yeah gene where he falls episode. asleep and like wakes up in the future or exactly yeah. exactly it's one of those things that everybody has seen and they never forget Try to remember another episode of Name of the Game. I doubt if you could do it. <laughs> I do remember one. As a matter of fact, I remember one with, with Robert Culp and Susan St. James. And, oh, and, and, and a lot of it took place inside, uh, a, it wasn't even an abandoned warehouse. It was bigger than a warehouse. It was like an old skating rink or something. Well, we don't care strange. about that. Spielberg never touched that <laughs> show. No, certainly not. With L.A. 2017, which was, was the it. name of yeah. the episode he directed, Barry Sullivan played the publishing magnate who dozes off at the wheel and wakes up to find himself in a world of the future, what, 40 no, it's years? Gene Berry who dozes Gene, off. Oh, I'm sorry, Gene Berry. And, and meets Barry Sullivan, who's this huge uh, industrial That's I mean. That's head I mean. because, like, big business had uh, basically become world government. Exactly. And all of these miniature governments overcome with smog and pollution and so on were all fighting for control. Mm -hmm. You sure wonder how that got made, you know? That, uh, There's such an unusual show. There, like, you know. you, you're watching the show and you notice there are no... Uh, Minorities, and there's one off uh, throwaway line of dialogue where you hear this PA system. Somebody saying, "You know, a black person was just seen in <laughs> such and such corridor." Yeah, <laughs> oh it's goodness. it's amazing that they got yeah. away with all that on network yeah. TV. Yeah. And I I think a lot of it worked because they could say, "Oh, this is the future," and I think that's how they were able to make their little social comment. That's certainly why Star Trek got away with. It. Is that oh, available sure. on cassette? Or, uh, I wish it was, but I think it is aired every so often on KCBS here locally. They tend to show the, those shows in the middle of the night without much warning. Mm. But if you're lucky and have a home VCR, you can click it on and yeah. uh, enjoy vintage Spielberg. There was a novelization of that episode written by Philip Wiley, in fact, which <laughs> is difficult to find because supposedly there was some uh, legal and contractual problems involved with the existence of the book and it was supposedly pulled from distribution shortly after it was published. Oh. Part of the part of the reason for that I think is because that particular episode was rewritten by the show's producer Dean Hargrove and I think that may have been part of the legal entanglement Does but for, for whatever reason I think uh, Philip Wiley died that same year mm. and I, I remember reading an interview with his wife and she said that he died of a broken heart or something like that and I'm sure that this app? No. maybe not maybe no. not that totally, but I'm sure that was part of it because he was very upset about the network and Universal's tampering of the show. Oh, I have really? to do something before we go on. Uh -oh. this, can this, we can we watch? You, you can you can watch you <laughs> can watch. As a matter of fact, I have to do the the legal ID now. Uh -huh. Now normally Mike does this. Normally Mike does this, but since Mike isn't here and he's he's not calling in again, uh, I'll have to do it myself. So. I will say that it's 11 o'clock here in uh, Los Angeles. And, uh, this is <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that? Uh, David Lynch. And it's, well, let me finish okay. it and then you go on. Yeah. Uh, this is KPFK uh, Los Angeles, uh, 90.7 FM. And uh, I'm Mel Gilden, and I'm here tonight with Mark Shepard and James Van Heis and Mark Wheelage, and we're talking about Steven Spielberg. We wanted to talk a little more about some little known you aspects. Have, did you have a funny story? <laughs> I, I want to hear, hey, hear Mark's hey, funny story. Hey, hold your story. I, I okay. got I to tell us. Okay. We, we wanted well, to concentrate in, uh, Oh yeah. We wanted to concentrate on some little known aspects about Spielberg's career. Not all of which he remembers today and not all of which uh, he would like to remember. I think. Did you, you interviewed him then for the for this Oh, I wish, no. I wish we could have. Mr. Spielberg is very tough to get to. We've read more interviews with him, though, than probably most people are aware exist. Why, is, why yeah. isn't he a copy? Well, he only I think does interviews, really, if it's in connection with a film. Plus, it's like George Lucas. Everybody wants to talk to him. Yeah. Mm. But, but, but uh, Pollock did. Plus, the, the word yeah. has it that supposedly he himself has a book that he's working on oh. with someone. Oh. But we've heard this for two years, and there's been... Yeah. Nothing, no actual official announcement ever made about and, it. And there are so many people around Spielberg that you have to get through. That yeah. it's, it's a case of nobody talks to the wise and, and wonderful wizard of Spielberg. Well, you know. That he's involved so. with is not going to have 
uh, say, an interview with uh, Villo Smigman, the uh, cinematographer of Close Encounters, Smigman, in which right. he talked about how uh, he uh, was basically blamed for the film going over budget because that was Spielberg's first major film. Well, as a matter of fact, Jaws, that, that's something I wanted to get that later. But that's something I wanted to get into the. Uh, uh, little-known aspects of Spielberg's career. One of the stories I wanted to tell was the time that Spielberg was fired off of production at Universal, which is not a story that's widely known. In fact, I've never seen it printed anywhere. Then how did you find out about it? Uh, you have to we, talk to we a, do lot some people, a lot, lot of digging. people also deny it. No, it wasn't yeah. me. So you know, how do you know it's, How do you know what happened? This is basically what happened. He shot, how do you, he how do you know what happened? I mean, I mean how, how can you be sure that it happened? He shot an episode of Night Gallery, only one episode in addition to the Night Gallery movie, oh called Make Me Laugh with Godfrey Cambridge as a down-on-his-luck comedian who can't make anybody laugh. Mm -hmm. He meets uh, a genie, played by Jackie Vernon, who grants him the, uh, the gift of making everyone laugh. And then he, of course, finds that it's sort of a Midas touch thing where now no matter what he says, people just fall down laughing hysterically at every single thing he says. Anyway, uh, Spielberg was under a lot of pressure during these uh, television years and was told by the executives don't go for those artsy-fartsy camera shots. Just get the thing done. Mm -hmm. Just do it. Get those 10, 15 pages of dialogue out a day. That's all we want. We don't want Stanley Kubrick. We just want the shows on the air. So he said, all right, that's what I'm going to do. And what he did was, as if to uh, give his little sarcastic answer to the TV executives, he shot 10 pages of dialogue for this episode in one shot, oh. which is sort of frowned upon in television. This is a, a camera that would just dolly in and out close-ups of people's pace, faces. They would do their line, then he would dolly back to a two-shot and let them do their little dialogue thing going back and forth. And this went on for like ten Wasn't minutes. Wasn't that hard on the actors? I mean, TV actors are not used to memorizing Exactly. Things. It was almost uh, kind of an Alfred Hitchcock yeah, rope kind like of rope, thing where yeah. it was a ten-minute mm -hmm. take. Anyway, when this film showed up to the editors a few days later, they said, this is incredible. This is totally unprofessional and, uh, unprofessional and just cannot be used. And so uh, the, he went to a big dispute and refused to reshoot it. So he was canned and, interestingly enough, went on to shoot L.A. 2017 right after that. Mm. So the studio had to bring in another director to finish the episode and change it. And just by a matter of chance, they hired Geno Swark, mm. who, of course, later directed Jaws 2. And I, I thought that was quite ironic, considering that Mr. Swark had to follow in Stephen's uh, well, he footsteps lot. doing Jaws 2 a few years later. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those little-known aspects. When I interviewed Jack Laird for the book, who, and he was producer of Night Gallery during those years, he would not take responsibility for having fired Spielberg. And he told me several times he did not want to be known around Hollywood as the, the man, man who fired <laughs> Steven Spielberg. And I, I believe him. Uh, Sid Sheinberg backed up his story, and they blamed it on an unnamed NBC executive who is no longer among the living. And you know, this reminds they wanna, me. Of, uh, they didn't want to give his name. This, so. Yeah, I was just going to yeah, say this reminds like me Spock of Harlan's story. story about about the Spock ears. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That they, they they ended up blaming it on on some poor schnook in the art department. Yeah, yeah. and that I, it could be said that that's what's wrong with Spielberg today is that nobody says no to him. I don't know. I think, pe who I think says people no do. Who, I think people do occasionally. Uh, Frank Marshall is not a yes man. Uh, I know, I, I've met Frank a couple of times, I just know him very, very casually, mm -hmm. but I know he's not afraid to tell Stephen, you know, when he's wrong or when uh, maybe the, there might be a better way to do something. Mm -hmm. And I understand Spielberg encourages that kind of thing on the set. With his Even though he is in control, mm -hmm. he will take outside input. Hmm. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, along with that, you, you hear a lot, especially from people who speak French, uh, about, about the auteur theory of sure. filmmaking about how, how the director is actually the author of the film and the writer had nothing to do with it and the actors have nothing to do with it and the guy who does the lighting has nothing to do with it that it's all the director and mm -hmm. he's he's the one who gives the you can tell how I'm really angry about this I, I, I don't believe any of it at all mm -hmm. uh, in the first place do you believe it and in the second place does Stephen believe it I think the auteur theory is only true with certain very powerful uh, very strong willed directors Spielberg is one of them. He Alfred is. Hitchcock is another one. Stanley Kubrick is another, and so is Woody Allen. There are just a handful of directors. Well, Woody Allen writes his own stuff, that. too, and he exactly. acts in it. Exactly, you know, or has a hand in the writing in the case of Spielberg. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think Spielberg's best talents lie in the area of writing. 
uh, they sure do in the in the sense of visual uh, a visual eye for mm -hmm. films and he's been able to capture a lot of things in a way that no one else can just his vision of filmmaking I think goes a lot further than what we've seen from other directors for example I, I can't imagine somebody uh, saying oh maybe Richard Donner has an easily identifiable style because he does many different kinds of movies mm -hmm. But Spielberg, Spielberg does have a certain unerring cinematic eye. Can His you put films it in words? have well, there there are a lot of traits. Uh, in my notes here, I've got uh, some elements, just some common themes that have run throughout Spielberg's films. Uh, I can find them here. No uh, zoom one lenses. Of them, is, is, is that's important. one of the visual elements, but just in the no wire uh, hangers. No, <laughs> no wire hangers. Uh, um, just in the story elements of Spielberg's films. Always you have the central theme of ordinary people caught up in extraordinary circumstances. That sounds very simple, but this is a recurring thing that happens time after time in Spielberg's films. Mm -hmm. He also concentrates on a chase of sorts. Either someone is chasing someone else, or they themselves are being chased. In the movie that was on tonight on Channel 13, Sugarland Express, uh, we have a chase movie. We mm -hmm. have we have a double chase going on. Goldie Hawn and her husband are being pursued by the police, while they are trying to chase their uh, baby, who has been essentially kidnapped by the authorities. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the second element. A third element I think uh, that's common to many of Spielberg's films is the idea of placing children in danger. Think of Jaws, where we have children uh, swimming in the same water as a deadly shark, or Close Encounters, where a child is taken away by aliens, or uh, E.T., where the children are being pursued by the police, or Poltergeist, where the kids are being torn apart by ghosts. Yeah, and mm -hmm. kidnapped. Time and time again, well, these Well, it's a fortunate director who can choose the kind of material that he wants to do. Sure. You know. Well, yeah. we seem to like to pay to see it. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true enough. And s more and more Spielberg is going out of his way to do films, at least the ones he directs, in which he can work with children. It was his idea to have a child actor in... In uh, Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. even though there uh, wasn't a major child performer in Raiders of the Lost Ark. In fact, after he finished E.T., Spielberg said, knew he was going to do Indiana Jones next, and he was real depressed because he knew he wasn't going to work with kids. Mm -hmm. And so he went That's out That's real unusual, way. isn't it? I mean, for a director to want to work with kids. Yeah, well, after mm -hmm. E.T., with E.T., he realized how much he really enjoyed it because E.T. was the first film he did which had the a large, important, central cast members as children instead of uh, just supporting actors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, he worked with the children every day. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Jaws, they were in just a few scenes, and in other films, they were in just a few scenes. In Close <coughs> Encounters, they were in just a few scenes. Do you feel that, uh, that uh, The Temple of Doom is a successful film? It's successful financially, but... Uh, I mean, successful artistically. Artistically, no. Neither, neither Jim nor myself uh, really enjoyed Indiana Jones 100%. There are, there are definitely some trouble spots in the film, and I think... Uh, 60 or 70 percent of them are writing problems more mm -hmm. than anything I else. I wrote elsewhere that so what it, if you can compare the two Raiders of the Lost Ark if you wanted you can if you wanted to say what the story is about it takes you about a minute and a half to explain what it's about yeah, yeah a very a very relate. complex Indiana plot. Jones sure. you can give the plot in one sentence and you're not leaving anything out mm -hmm. certainly mm -hmm. what I was going to say is if there are plot problems with the movie and you say that Steven Spielberg is an auteur then he is responsible for the writing too, even though he didn't really write that stuff. It was the same two folks well, who wrote. Well, he has conferences American with Peter. the writers. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's very well known that that's the way that they wrote both Raiders and Indiana Jones. They mm -hmm. simply shut up Lucas Spielberg and uh, who was the writer in this case? What, uh, Gloria Huck. Gloria, Gloria, yeah. Gloria yeah. Huck and, and her husband Willard. Willard. Yeah. Willard. Willard. Yeah. And they put them all in a little room and thrashed out the plot over a one-week period. And the best sequence is, was in the first draft of. Uh, First draft of Raiders, the the mind, uh, the mind chase. Right, that was one of yeah. the uh, famous sequences. I'm impressed that Mark yeah, Lawrence Kasdan uh, knows, knows a lot of stuff. That's why. Hey, he's here. Um, what a sharp guy. I, the thing yeah. <laughs> yes. 